Thank you very much, and I'd just like to thank the organizers. This is a great opportunity to reevaluate our work and um, get some feedback. I start off our panel by introducing the project that's the focus of our presentations, an open access multimedia online archive called Re-Envisioning Japan, Japan as Destination in 20th Century Visual and Material Culture. My colleagues joining me on this panel will describe the strategic and technical decisions behind the design and functionality of the site in more detail. My presentation is the longest, uh, but we've timed it so that we do leave some question, uh, time for question and answers. I focus on re-envisioning Japan's double role. It embodies my research on representations of Japan and its place in the world in the first half of the 20th century to the visual and material culture of travel and education. It's also a pedagogical tool in Tourist Japan, a course I've been teaching since 2002 to complement this research. My presentation is divided into three sections, uh, four sections, sorry, an overview, uh, background uh, to my collection and also to the way this project evolved into a digital humanities project, pedagogy using uh, re-envisioning Japan in my course, Tourist Japan, and the rewards, challenges, and future development. I'll begin by introducing Re-Envisioning Japan's basic layout and the premise and scope of my research. The three key objectives of this project are uh, preservation, access, and historical analysis. Re-Envisioning Japan makes available a wide range of images and objects that generally have not been a priority for collecting institutions until recently, if at all. This gives users the opportunity to work with less conventional, ephemeral primary sources. With the exception of one category, everything on the site belongs to my personal collection of items belonging to the broad categories of Japan-related travel, tourism, and education. This collection consists of several hundred postcards and over 1,150 other objects, including about 116 millimeter, eight millimeter, and super eight millimeter film prints. At present, almost two thirds of the collection has been digitized and uploaded to the site. As the collection grew, two focal points emerged. First, the wave of American tourism that peaked in the 1930s and the concurrent rise of Japan's profile as a modern nation. And second, English language media focus on post-war Japan. I chose 1970 as a rough cutoff date for the collection for a number of reasons, but I selectively include artifacts from earlier and more recent periods that suggest continuities, ways in which Japan's past recurrently informs its present. The collection and subsequently the site's focus um, predominantly denote a US and more generally English language audience and the American tourist and educational experience of Japan. The objects and images on this site tell us something about the individuals that used or created them and the cultural, political, and economic systems that produced them. Re-envisioning Japan is divided into five generically distinct exhibits. Edification and information comprises works on general culture, history, and language, missionary and social work related materials, objects dating from the US occupation of Japan, and US World War II propaganda related to Japan. Leisure and entertainment includes objects, including some postcards, related to advertising, shopping, and Japan's presence at international expositions, exhibitions, and world fairs. Photographs, slides, and stereo views are joined by several genres of literature, including children's literature, magazines, memoirs, and travel literature. Japanesque or Japan-inspired sheet music is also included here because it represents an early instance of Japanese influence on 20th century American popular culture. Moving images define the 20th century in an unprecedented way. They're represented on the site by small gauge films, 16 millimeter, regular eight millimeter, and super eight millimeter, ranging from the anonymous amateur travel film to widely circulated educational titles. Postcards is divided into 17 subgenres ranging from actors, children's, cities and sites, and colonial to occupation, recreation, war, and women. These categories are only examples of the rich diversity that characterizes this mode of communication. The final exhibit is tourism and travel. 
The human act of travel generates a wide variety of objects, including brochures, guides, hotel ephemera, maps, and ephemera related to transportation by air, land, and sea. This also includes postcards, most notably those of major shipping lines, and travel guides are also in this category, divided into general, general guides to Japan the country, and specific guides to um, specific locations. Some books, brochures, pamphlets, guides, and magazines feature a red Read More button in the lower right-hand corner that allows users to explore select inside content. Red info, I'm sorry, red item info buttons, also in the lower right-hand corner of some objects, bring up a page of information that goes beyond the basic metadata that accompanies each object. And I have a one and a half minute clip of the website in action that I'd like to share with you um, to illustrate some of these functions. Okay. And we used flex paper to do this. I think Lisa will be probably talking about that um, a little bit more. We've since, we've since gotten more films up on the site, and we now have a timeline under 16 millimeter, which Josh will be talking about. The process of building re-envisioning Japan gives me opportunities to work beyond the boundaries of Japanese studies and film and media studies, but it's also a natural extension of previous research. When my research objectives began to take shape in 2002, I had just finished a book on silent cinema, a subject defined by loss, particularly for Japan. Lacking the familiar familiarity and sense of immediacy provided by cinematic image of early 20th century Japan, I was drawn to the life and landscape of that time and place through other material means. I also wanted a more immediate sense of Japan's profile as a player in the increasingly complex media channels of the 20th century. From the start, I was less interested in superlative collecting than in exploring a sampling of the variety of objects that I encountered. I began with early postcards, which I was initially drawn to as visual records of place, especially the urban landscapes most likely to have been captured on film. I found that postcards are also reminders of personal relationships between the East and West, as well as Japan's earliest presence overseas at European and American world's fairs and expositions. They also provide a glimpse of Japan's rising presence in the international world order, as well as views of an imaginary Japan on foreign land, such as this slide of the Japanese village at Massachusetts Wonderland Amusement Park, advertised elsewhere as a 15-minute tour of the Flowery Kingdom, complete with its own Mount Fuji. The collection gradually grew to encompass other media, photographs, stereo views, tourist brochures, and guidebooks, objects of non-Japanese origin that featured representations of Japan, and various magazines, books, and assorted publications, all traces of some individual's interest in or voyage to Japan. 
As motifs emerged, I devised working categories in an attempt to construct a meaningful framework for these things. The predominance of material generated by travel and education-related activities and the natural kinship between these two activities emerged as the connective tissue for my archive. Educational items tend to be of American or British origin. Tourism ephemera generally originate in Japan. These two overarching categories complement each other in useful ways. I used the term Tourist Japan as a working title for the project early in its development, linking the armchair traveler reading about Japan with the traveler who physically moves through space. Tourist and tourism are often considered disparaging terms, signifying passive, shallow consumers and consumption, but I agree with others who value them as flexible and inclusive. The rise of 20th century tourism is central to understanding 20th century cultural flow and cultural identity. The tourist perspective is personal, opening up possibilities for multiplicity of narrative perspectives. This research project underwent a metamorphosis when I made the switch to technologically mediated scholarship, but it spent a long time cocooning. A dozen years ago, I knew about my colleague Morris Eves' Blake project, but I'm pretty sure I didn't know it had anything to do with something called digital humanities. It wasn't until around six years later, when I came to terms with this project as a study of visual and material culture, that I realized I'd been stymied by the prospect of a scholarly monograph, which was increasingly at odds with my evol evolving vision for turning my research into useful, meaningful scholarship. By this point, around 2009, I was on my fifth or sixth iteration of my Tourist Japan course, and my collection was now a tested and familiar teaching tool. In addition to being part of the Japanese studies curriculum, Tourist Japan is cross-listed with film and media studies, and film screenings are an important part of the course. My background in silent cinema had already given me an appreciation for the materiality of film as an object and the significance of its mutable nature. But for this project, I focused on small gauge films that often fall under the category of orphan works. These are critical, uh, there are critical intersections between small gauge film and tourism and education, especially during the 1920s and 30s, and again after World War II. In the first half of the 20th century, the growing popularity of amateur travel films reflected the rise of popular tourism, and educational and informational films about Japan's post-war resurgence and culture, often sponsored by the Japan National Tourism Organization, and the Japan External Trade Organization were plentiful from the 1980s through the, 1980, uh, through the 1960s, um, from the 1960s through the early 80s. During the 2007-2008 academic year, I took a sabbatical to complete a program in film preservation and archiving and started investing in rewinds and splicers. Within a year, stacks of film had taken up residence in our dining room, and my husband started referring to our new decor as early archival. Madness met method when I approached my colleague Nora Dimmick, then head of the Multimedia Center, with the idea that I could optimize the use of my collection as both a teaching and research resource by putting it online. I was also already thinking of my project as evolving into collaborative research, and a digital platform would make this possible. Her offer to use library resources to digitize the collection was an unforeseen major breakthrough, and we began discussing plans for developing this digital humanities project shortly thereafter. This is a good point for me to shift to using Re-Envisioning Japan as a teaching resource. Tourist Japan is a problem-based course for both graduate and undergraduate students that meets once a week for a double period. The course has no prerequisites. Class assignments include weekly readings and film screenings, and nearly every week I introduce an object or group of objects for my collection. The course has three objectives, which I can sum up as, first, to explore Japan's representation as a foreign destination with a focus on the first half of the 20th century. Two, to learn how to use material culture in historical research by studying images and objects that construct a rich history of how Japan has defined itself and been defined by others, and three, to build critical awareness of the ways in which visual and material culture influence personal and or public perceptions of Japan. 
Some of the issues we address in class include visual and material culture's role in creating a global profile for Japan in the context of tourism and promotional education. Ways in which illustrations, photography, and film reflect changes in urban space, rural culture, industry, geography, and military and political authority. Postcard culture and recurrent iconography, coded images, and other patterns that link, visual, that link visual and material culture and evolving concepts of nationalism and cultural identity. Midterm and final assignments have always involved the critical analysis of objects or images. But as my collection developed, I encouraged students to work with its contents. This past spring, Reenvisioning Japan was developed enough to require students to use it for assignments. For the midterm, they worked in groups to carry out a research and metadata exercise that entailed the close study of a set of objects and the development of an online exhibit featuring these objects. This was essentially a dry run of their final assignment, individual presentations of their own exhibits of chosen objects complete with requisite metadata and a five to seven page essay detailing their exhibit's premise and an assessment of the experience creating it. Each week, a portion of class time was set aside for various projects. Designated study time with physical artifacts, digital workshops that included an introduction to and demonstration of re-envisioning Japan and Omeka, which was the platform that they used to create their online exhibits, demonstrations and critiques of other relevant digital humanities projects, an online metadata workshop, and finally, a workshop on creating an, on an online exhibit in Omeka. At the end of the semester, most students chose objects for their individually authored exhibits that allowed them to construct a narrative reflecting personal interests. Some of the more engaging exhibits focused on the representation of women, religion, film history, architecture and landscape, memory, children's literature, and Japan's relation to China. Student feedback reflected a much more immediate understanding of Japan's place in the socio-cultural landscape of the 20th century. They were able to set their own coordinates for mapping out cultural change through their analysis of surviving images and objects, and the perceptions of the people intrinsically linked to them. In How Objects Speak, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education last August, Peter N. Miller makes the cogent observation that, quote, the digital, far from killing the material world, seems only to intensify our attachment to it. In turning this project into an online archive, digital technology acted as the catalyst unleashing my collection's potential to make meaning. Digital mediation facilitates conceptual shifting among disciplinary perspectives and has made it possible to experiment with context, organization, and description what I've seen referred to elsewhere as the, quote, recombinatory power of the digital archive. Flexibility, which includes being able to make immediate adjustments and alterations, is another virtue of working digitally because of this project's recuperative nature as image and object driven research. My objective is to derive questions from the images and objects themselves rather than use them to illustrate pre-existing narratives. And my experience confirms that collecting is essentially an unending dialogue between present and past. Rebuilding contexts of the past by connecting things in relevant and meaningful ways has underscored the project's potential for collaborative research. From the start, plans have included a means to allow contributors who can register and contribute content to the archive, creating a dynamic community of users who can share ideas and related research. The collaborative nature of building this project is crucial to fine-tuning my objection, objectives and the best ways to provide access to the collection and related research. The reiterative, uh, reiterative development process is time-consuming but ultimately rewarding. The most obvious challenges are software and hard hardware limitations and my own technological limitations, which are eternal and crop up on a daily basis. Attending to logistical details takes up time that I could use for writing and research, but I also find that so-called logistical snags often reveal more complex intellectual issues that are vital to the nature of my research. Student assistance helps with problem solving, and such collaboration has in turn led to both logistical and intellectual breakthroughs. Adding films to the project has raised the most vexing copyright issues, 
best practices often seem to be all over the map. I've applied for outside funding for three years without success, and all too often feedback reflects disciplinary reluctance to acknowledge this work as legitimate scholarship. At work, colleagues are beginning to discuss the issues involved in evaluating digital humanities projects as scholarship, but so far this discussion has been surprisingly low key. I end on a positive note. This year I received funds from the University of Rochester for two important tasks on our agenda recording and digitizing my sheet music collection, and digitizing my collection of films, which my colleague Josh Rompf will talk about in more detail. In the future, we need to further address framework development in order to bring the site to the point that it's fully interactive, including a means for community engagement. Additional plans for technical steps to complete the dynamic presentation of the collection include, for example, a spatial tool for researchers to create historic travel itineraries, new content based on enhanced media presentation of fragile objects such as travel guides and maps, and other tools to extend research capability. Also, I still think um, of a linked digital publication that will draw on a systematic examination of the site as a research resource and its community in action benefiting from the interpretation and contextualization that such interaction makes possible. Thank you very much. Okay. So my part of the talk is gonna be about re-envisioning librarianship. Um, I'm going to talk about four elements of how I re-envisioned librarianship through my engagement with Re-Envisioning Japan project. So, so a change in orientation. When we first started down this road in 2011, I was a fairly traditional subject librarian and also a department head. I ran a small film library, the Multimedia Center. and. Um, it's in the main library, the Rush Rees Library, which is the humanities. So I was a fairly traditional film and media studies librarian. I worked with Dr. Bernardi to locate films and make sure she had reserves. We, or I ordered film materials. I worked with other subject librarians. And I worked with, um, in an interdisciplinary program that had faculty members that were drawn from across the humanities and social sciences, including history, anthropology, English, visual and cultural studies, and of course, modern languages and cultures, Dr. Bernardi's home department. As the head of the Multimedia Center, I was leaning, leading one part of the library that combined technology, media, and academic librarianship. The other subject librarian, subject specialist librarians at University of Rochester were fairly uh, print focused and film was treated at U of R as a special collection. So I ended up with other special collections that were media focused like uh, braille embossing, uh, CD-ROMs, cassettes, um, language learning materials that had mixed media in them. And in other words, I was always leading a department in flux. In 2001, when I arrived at U of R, my entire library was filled with a collection of laser discs and CD-ROMs. I still have 16 millimeter collections and the laser discs. The cassettes, thankfully, are gone. Now, there are no collections in the multimedia center. Um, we've moved all the film collections to the art and music library. And we have reimagined our staff and our spaces to support new modes of scholarship, new ex expressions of faculty research, and new manifestations of teaching and learning using digital tools and methodologies. So this represents a real shift in priorities. So clearly all of this transformation didn't happen overnight. There were a number of institutional shifts that led to the creation of a digital humanities center and the development of a library program that supports projects like Re-Envisioning Japan. So some of these were uh, disciplinary trends that made digital scholarship more accessible and desirable, including the fear from some faculty members that traditional humanities departments would lose their edge and would lose their ability to attract the best graduate students. That is a real driving fear at Rochester. 
There was also the evolution of university IT from a we do it all shop that included an educational technology center to an enterprise level IT organization whose support works on a service level agreement and basically supports Blackboard as a content management system but does not provide a content management system or a sandbox or anything for digital scholarship. There was also a shift from physical media to streaming media and the availability and the flexibility of staff members. And I can't stress that enough. Staff members who were willing to retrain and relearn and stay up to date and um, support teaching and learning in all manner of media and technology. And um, that, that, that's been integrally successful. We also had the arrival of a new dean of the libraries whose support was instrumental to building a program that's scaling to meet demand. Prior to June 2013, Lisa Wright and I were just about it. And um, now we have Josh, who's our humanities programmer. We have a GIS research specialist, Blair Tinker. And we're really flourishing. And we're shedding our old skin as a film library and um, allowing us to take up digital humanities activity full time. Okay, This one, different tools. So some of these tools are intellectual, and some of them are software tools and hardware tools. But anyway, I sometimes wonder if digital humanities offers a disciplinary bridge to not only interdisciplinary scholarship, but to interdisciplinary scholarship where we, the librarians, are one of those disciplines at the table. I think our expertise in managing collections of books is eminently transferable to managing digital representations of material objects. Re-envisioning Japan is an excellent example of this. In a lot of ways, Dr. Bernardi opened up a new way for me to look at cataloging. And isn't it awesome that she talks about metadata? I'm like, that was like groundbreaking to me, right? So she opened up this new way for me to think about cataloging because she, when she came to me, she had this very detailed bento database where each item in the collection was accessioned and described in the scholarly context and all without the help of librarians. What I was able to bring to the project was the transformation of the data to MODS format for ingestion into our digital asset management system. And I also came to realize that there's a new role for us in helping faculty members who, embar who are embarking on a new project and helping design rational data systems and data models that allow the data to be remixed, reused, preserved, and repurposed for new technologies in the future. So what I learned from re-envisioning Japan was how important it was to think about the materiality when designing these digital surrogates, a concept that applies to data models as well as discovery interfaces. When I talk to faculty about creating online scholarly projects like re-envisioning Japan, I have a much richer vocabulary and a much deeper skill set. I talk about how important, it, how important is it to them to represent the material object. As you see the flex paper, you can clearly tell you've represented the apparatus of the book. That was very important in this project. Other tools we've incorporated are timelines and new ways to represent materials so that we're not constrained by the technology. The tools we've incorporated into re-envisioning Japan and into other online scholarly projects we're engaged in allow us to ask new questions about the texts, and they also allow us to explore new epistemologies. Through considering materiality, be it a text, an object, or a work of art, how does the digital representation help us to know what we might think we know, but now we can know it in a different way? Through a critical interrogation. And finally, Re-envisioning Japan represents a new role for librarians in the 21st century, a move from managing scholarly communication to participating in the production in a way that is much deeper than selecting and acquiring resources. We've moved from providing services to collaborating in the full life cycle of scholarly publication in the 21st century. 
We're developing new 21st century scholarly work practices that are essentially collaborative. They require a range of expertise that is impossible for a single scholar to possess. These expert teams have a place in, for librarians and have a place for library technologists who can ensure this new form of digital scholarship endures just as, we, just as we've stewarded the written text that came before them. Thank you. Can I just speak from here, or do I have to? I don't actually have any slides, so I'm just gonna leave that up. And I'm just gonna talk very briefly about how the digital images are created, and then Josh is gonna do a very quick run through of the site so that you can see how things end up looking. So as Nora had said, when this project started off, um, I was doing the primary digitization, and it was myself with a flatbed scanner at my desk. And since then, we've evolved into um, a digitization center that has a number of flatbed scanners, an ATIS book drive scanner, and a copy stand. So the way that things generally work when they want to go um, to bring stuff up is Dr. Bernardi brings me a large collection of items that she'd like to go up to her site. She's decided what category they would best go into, and we sort of discuss it briefly, but she generally has a very strong idea of how she wants things to look and where they should go. I go through the, um, the materials that she's brought in and make a decision based on um, the state of their the state of how they are. So if they're smaller objects, they just get scanned. If they're more fragile, they tend to be photo um, stand cop uh, photographed so that they're, oh goodness. <laughs> they um, go on the copy stand so that they are, I just completely lost my train of thought, I apologize. <laughs> To keep them safe and to keep them, especially if the bindings are tight, to be photographed, we put them onto an ATIS book stand, which allows the object to be held open and flat so that I can shoot both images of it. And then they're taken and they're put into our flex paper application, which Josh was able to find based on a certain decision-making process he went through so that they look best represented for how the material object is. It allows you to flip through it and see it and see it as an actual object rather than just as a flat sort of thing. Um, the other thing that is probably the largest collection on the site is the postcards, and we photograph them front and back, or we scan them front and back, and then we put them side by side so that you can see the recto and verso at the same time so that you understand you're looking at one object rather than looking at two separate things at a different time. So that's essentially kind of my role in it. It's gone from not being just me anymore, so I do have a small student staff that's helping me, and we're just continuing to put stuff up as Professor Bernetti brings it in. My part, and do you want to go through the site? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, I know Dr. Bernardi uh, showed a brief screen recording of the site, but it's gone through a few changes since um, that was produced. So I'm just going to uh, get out of the PowerPoint here for a second and pull up the Reenvisioning Japan website. Hopefully, it loads quickly. Um, so this is built with technologies that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, was actually built um, in WordPress uh, with a lot of heavily customized PHP templates. Um, we had to decide, uh, first of all, let me backtrack. Um, I came to the project a little bit later, so we had another programmer in our digital initiatives unit. Um, Vicki Fontaine, who kind of laid the groundwork for this, uh, and she also did a lot of the uh, really um, beautiful design work on the site. So I came in a little bit later, and I was focused more on image viewing and also on the, um, the film scanning project and doing all the encoding, transcoding work there. Um, and then we have also um, I just kind of try to maintain the site um, as we go on and fix um, different issues that come up. So we're working mostly with open source, um, readily available WordPress plugins. So this is Next Gen Gallery. Um, this is how we organize all the collections. And actually, the image viewer is custom. It's not a WordPress plugin. It's something I built using a JavaScript library called HighSlideJS. And it seems to just be hanging. 
So I'll skip past that and I'll just talk about the moving images because you did get a chance to see the image viewer as well as flex paper. Um, so being in Rochester, we're quite lucky because it's the home of Kodak and they still have a digital intermediate laboratory that can do um, basically any type of film printing or scanning that you could imagine. Uh, so we worked with Kyle Alvett, who actually is now working for the George Eastman House, correct? Um, and uh, he scanned all of the moving images um, as Apple ProRes 422 files um, with a .mov container. And um, I think he was using uh, Spirit Data Cine for scanning. So he was scanning everything in full HD. Um, these files, when we got them, were huge. Uh, they were anywhere between 15 gigabytes of film to about 60 gigabytes of film. So obviously, you know, long-term preservation was also an issue for us, so we ended up coming up with some server space to store the films. Uh, and then the next task was actually transcoding them for streaming. Um, I didn't want to sacrifice quality, but I had to get the size down significantly. Um, so I ended up using an open source tool called uh, FFmpeg, which is you know the Swiss army knife of video encoding, and I highly, highly recommend it. It's a command line tool that can be compiled fairly easily. And we were using a codec library called um, libx264, so we were encoding everything in uh, h264 um, with an mp4 container. So I had a student actually um, who is also at the L. Jeffrey Selznick School of Film Preservation, and we sat down and we ran a bunch of tests and basically tried to work with different compression algorithms and figure out what the best um, balance would be, you know, between file size and image quality. So we managed to do a pretty good job. Um, we knocked the file sizes down probably by 60 or 70 percent. Uh, and the visual fidelity is essentially lossless. So next we had to organize the films. And initially we had just, you know, put them in ordered lists on the website. And then we, we decided that that wasn't necessarily, um, it, it wasn't conducive to browsing. Um, and there's so many of them, there's over 100. So we have different timelines for 16 millimeter, Super 8, regular 8. And this is an API called Timeline JS, uh, which was developed by the Knight Lab at Northwestern University. It's all open source, and um, in our case, we're using uh, a JSON file. All this data um, is stored in a JSON file and is parsed by the API and displayed here. Um, you can also use a Google Docs spreadsheet for those of you that are you know, not as comfortable with programming. So we can scroll through the timeline. And eventually, we're going to have more information here. Um, the films that we have cleared copyright for or the public domain films are currently available for streaming. Um, just trying to pick a good one to play. Does anyone have a preference? <laughs> well. What about the 30, it go back to the 37 one? Oh, yeah, the Agfa film? Uh, the Agfa film, yeah. Sure. That's a good one. So we're also um, using an open source video player called JW Player for streaming. Uh, there are a few things that we need to do just to get everything ready for streaming. We need to, to basically change the file structure so that um, there's a specific move flag uh, that should be at the front of the file, so we don't have to wait for it to completely buffer through um, if we want to, you know, move to a different point in the film. Um, we can scan through it relatively quickly. I know the connection is a little slow here, but um, yeah, this is this is uh, an Agfa film from 1937 and uh, the German film, correct? Um, no, actually, this is a home movie. Oh, okay. Amateur film. Yeah, unidentified. I, that's why I do the programming. You're the film person. <laughs> we we just call it learning about Japan. It was um, I think it was a teacher who basically took a film of her class learning about Japan, and the little girls make uh, kimono. Okay. 
So yeah, I mean, as you can see here, I, I wish I could bring um, one of the ProRes files. I think this one was probably, you know, almost 20 gigs for a four minute film. I wish I could do a side by side comparison, but um, it, you'll just have to trust me on this one. The, uh, it's basically visually lossless. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's basically where the site stands right now. And as Professor Bernardi said, we're kind of looking into creating some other um, interactive uh, aspects of the site. Like I'm hoping to do some 3D scanning of physical ephemeral objects um, and put those up there with uh, a library called 3.js, but that's in the future. So thank you. We have like three minutes for a few quick questions. Oh, there's actually a microphone. Oh, sorry. There's a microphone. Um, how are you handling copyright issues? You must have some really interesting copyright problems. Um, for the, well, it's mostly for the movies. Um, and because we're really not reproducing anything else in its entirety, any of the printed material, and a lot of the postcards are very old. Um, the, um, what I'm using is the Pacific Film Archive has a really good um, guideline um, up and I'm basically going through the same process that they recommend, which is sending a letter saying that, you know, I think I've identified you as the copyright holder and do you give permission for this um, and take it from there. Uh, there are a couple that I know I will not get permission for, Walt Disney um, and uh, Gems Films, which is Sony, uh, and that I'll just do re excerpts of the film, uh, what I consider to be fair use. Um, I did early on go talk to the um, uh, lawyer at the university for advice, and he pretty much told me to cover my tracks and do it from scratch. So I decided to do that. A lot of the films that I have basically, um, not a lot, but a few are on YouTube. Um, some of them are in, on internet archive. Um, so people have already gone and put them up, but I know you can't really use that as a guideline. Uh, uh, my name is Roger Zender. Um, a, a quick question, I know we're short on time, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the sustainability of this project and the, the possibility of supporting other faculty projects that have this. So we're talking about this collaboration with the DH Center, which is great, and it's, it's a single project that's great. So supporting this to the long term and the ability to take on new projects through a DH Center, <laughs> uh, like how, how scalable is this? Well, the beauty of this project is, is Dr. Bernardi handles all of the work on the back end. So that's scalable for us. <laughs> it's so, and we have applied for a clear postdoctoral fellow. Um, and then, and one of the things, if we get that person in visual culture, will be to help move this to the Omeka framework so that we can um, take advantage of more of the metadata, the rich metadata that this, this site architecture doesn't do. Um, that's always the, the question, right? Do we consider it a period piece or do we consider that these digital projects live at some point or end at some point and, and become the book, the 1947 volume on the shelf? I don't know that we've answered those questions yet. Um, clearly, we have the Blake Archive as an as a example. The Camelot Project at the University of Rochester just moved to a new platform. Um, I think it depends on whether it is considered an ongoing, ongoing scholarship. And in, in this case, it is ongoing scholarship, yeah. I do hope it to go on. Mm -hmm. And if Dr. Bernardi were to like move to Case Western, <laughs> it would come with her. <laughs> I have been talking about Campus Envy, so. <laughs> we'll support you. All right. Please help me thank the uh, panel from Rochester one more time, please.